Well, good afternoon. My name is Diane Pelletier. I'm the finance director for the city of Boulder City, and I'd like to welcome you, the citizens of Boulder City, to the citizen workshop to review the proposed annual operating budget for fiscal year 2021-22. Are we starting again? No, I just, I'm getting it right here. Okay. I just had the, power, uh, the wrong thing up. There you go. Okay. Uh, this meeting is, since it's not a regularly scheduled meeting, it is a workshop. There will not be call-ins at the beginning of the meeting. The call-ins will be uh, scheduled at the end of, the, of our presentation, and citizens will be able to call in at the number provided, or they can email questions to finance at bcnb.org. It disappeared again. Okay, let me, let me repeat this because I guess we've had some technical difficulties. Since this meeting is a workshop and not a meeting, there will not be call-ins allowed at the beginning of the meeting, and the call-ins will happen after our presentation. And a call-in number will be provided after the presentation for the public to ask budget-related questions, or they can email questions to finance at bcnb.org. The goals for today's workshop are to present a clear picture to residents regarding the city's financial direction, present summaries of revenues and expenditures, including personnel costs, provide an overview and summary of all city funds. This is an operations and maintenance workshop. Discussion of capital improvement projects other than funding is not included in today's meeting. And uh, feel free to call in after the presentation or email at finance BC finance at bcnb.org with any budget questions. Before we get started into the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the budget, I just wanted to give citizens hopefully a reassuring uh, view of the general fund revenues. So this is part of a presentation that was done to the council and to citizens at the uh, second meeting in January this year. And it's a five-year plan where we project out uh, we show what's been received in revenues for the city and also project out the next five years. So I've, I've uh, highlighted a red dot on the screen, and that is the projected revenues for the general fund for next year. And as you can see, it looks to me like we are going to be close to what we were in 2020. So 2021, which was our bad year with COVID, shows a budget dip in uh, anticipated revenues, which we think may actually come in a little higher than what's shown there. Up until that big dip in 21, everything is actual numbers. But the 21 number is a budgeted number, and the 22 number is what we believe will be the revenues for the general fund for fiscal year 22. If anybody is interested at seeing more about the brochure that, that included this, this uh, this chart, they can go to the uh, Boulder City uh, financial page and look up the five-year financial plan. And in there, we have a lot of information about our projections for the next five years. But with this information, I will turn it over to Angela Manninen, the Boulder City budget manager, and she will get into the meat and potatoes of the upcoming year's budget. Angela? Thanks. Angela Manninen, budget manager. So projected revenue assumptions for fiscal year 22 are we're continuing to be fiscally conservative. Consolidated tax um, current budget is $11 million, which is in line with fiscal year 20 actual. Property tax revenues are budgeted 
similar to fiscal year 20 actual, even though our state projections are higher than that. Room tax is still expected to be low with a budget of 40% of fiscal year 20. So we're only budgeting 200,000 when our actual room tax revenue in 20 was 528,000. We also had uh, new seller lease revenues in fiscal year 21 that increased general fund rents over $1 million for fiscal year 22. Current proposals under consideration is increasing ambulance fees to reflect cost. Most of this cost would be picked up by the insurance companies. The electric fund revenue is reduced by 3% to reflect possible rate reductions. Water fund revenue is reduced by an anticipated $10 reduction in service fee costs. This is a year over year comparison of the general fund budget from 21 to 22. Um, if you, the actual increase in the budget is only 3% from 21 to 22 if you include the reinstated positions. So the budget for 22 with the transfers out is $40.4 million. If you take out the transfers out, it's $35.2 million. And if you included the reinstated positions for the budget for fiscal year 21, it was $34.2 million. So none of the departments are asking for any large requests. They're, everyone knows we are um, recovering from COVID and there's, um, we're just doing our best to be fru as frugal as possible, but keep the city running. We are requesting two new positions, but they're being partially offset with uh, contractor costs and also the moving a part-time person to a full-time. So all operating reserves for governmental and enterprise funds are currently fully funded. The general fund operating reserve is higher than the two months maximum recommended by the NRS. So the NRS recommends a maximum for the general fund of no more than two months um, with no less than one month. All other funds, including the enterprise funds um, that pay employees have a minimum 20% operating reserve and are fully funded. It's really important for these reserves to be fully funded as we are a pay go community and we do not like to take on debt. We need the cash on hand. Where does the general fund money come from? One item is taxes. So property and room tax combined is $1.9 million. License and permits is $1.5 million. Intergovernmental, which included, includes consolidated tax and fuel tax is $11.3 million, which we are expecting, our current projections from the state are higher than what we are currently showing in the budget. Um, charge for services are 3.9 million. This includes 2.3 million for golf courses, which was reduced $283,000 for the general fund as we're moving that green free revenue into the VERF fund to, per to purchase the golf cart leases. Court fines expected for next year are $433,000. Leases that go into the general fund are 13.8 million. That's with total leases of about 16.8 million and 20% of those go into the voter approved fund, which is about $3.3 million annually. Um, projected use of general fund balance is $7.3 million. Miscellaneous revenue, $255,000, with a total expected funding of the general fund of $40.4 million. Where the general fund money goes. So general government, which is city manager, city attorney, city clerk, IT, HR, communications, and BCTV, city council and finance is $6.5 million. Municipal court is $920,000. Public safety is $14.5 million, which includes fire of $5.6 5 <clears throat> 5 million, police of $7.2 million, dispatch of $1.2 million, and animal control of $450,000. Public works budget is $5.9 million. Recreation is $2.8 million. Golf courses is $3.5 million. A transfer to the Special Projects Fund, which is the CIP project, the CIP fund that houses the governmental projects is going to be $3.6 million. Other is $2.5 million, which includes a $1.5 million transfer to other governmental funds and a $1 million in contingency. So it's total expenses of $40.4 million. With that $40.4 million, 5.1 of it is transfers to governmental funds. 
So it's not actually expected to be spent, but put aside in case of emergency. And the same with the $1 million in contingency. So total governmental transfers are $5.1 million. There'll be a transfer to the special project CIP fund of $2 million for CIP projects. Currently, there's only $682,000 worth of projects scheduled, so the remainder of this money will go into an unallocated reserve to be used for future projects uh, approved by council. Also, in the special projects fund, $1.6 million of emergency capital reserve will be moved there to be used in case of an emergency. The VERF fund will have $495,000 transferred. Extraordinary maintenance will have $250,000. Compensated absences will have $150,000. Risk management will have 638,000, which includes 388,000 for our insurance and 250,000 for potential litigation costs. So although our operating reserves are currently fully funded, our special revenue funds are not currently fully funded. The one that is closest to being fully funded is our revenue stabilization fund. It currently has 2.5, or as of December 31st, it had $2.5 million in it. It would be fully funded at 10% of general fund expenses from the prior year, which is $2.9 million. Risk management is as at the end of De at December 31st last year was at $1.8 million. And again, it's 10% of general fund expenses that will fully funded at 2.9 million. Compensated absences at the end of December was 1.9 million. And fully funded would be the total amount of the liability, which is currently $3.6 million. Extraordinary maintenance has 1.7 million in it and will be fully funded at $10.1 million, which is 5% of the capital assets for the governmental funds. And VERF is at $2.1 million and again is the 5% of capital assets at $10.1 million. Other transfers include the voter improved fund. So all of these transfers are approved by ballot questions. There's a $1 million transfer to special projects for infrastructure. There's a total of $1.75 million to utilities for CIP projects. This includes $500,000 from lease revenue and $1.25 million from land sales. So the enterprise budgets, our airport budget for next year is $3.9 million. Proposed utility funds budgets combined are $36.5 million. The proposed cemetery budget is 175000 So starting with the airport, where does the airport money come from? So we're expected fuel tax to be at $19,000 next year. And CARES Act funding of $885,000, which is reimbursable expenses. This will leave $700,000 remaining for fiscal year 23 of our CARES Act grant for Boulder City. FAA grant for capital improvement projects of $960,000, license and permits of $5,000, rents and royalties of $478,000. This includes fuel sales and ground lease, commercial ground leases, which are not currently lower than expected due to COVID. Miscellaneous revenues of $6,000 and airport use of fund balance of 1.6 million. So total funding from the airport is $3.9 million where the airport money goes. Personnel costs of $525,000, operations of $486,000, capital projects of $1.95 million, depreciation of $1 million, and total expenses of $3.9 million. So although the depreciation at the airport is $1 million, the airport has funding available from FAA grants, so the airport's responsibility really of this depreciation is only $62,000. Um, estimated cash for fiscal year 22 for the airport is $609,000. The cash balance in the airport fund as of December 31st was $1.2 million and, include, and also had $418,000 in reserves. The utility enterprise funds, the electric proposed budget is $16.2 million. Water is $16.1. Sewer is $2.9 million. Landfill is 1.2 million with a combined budget of 36.5 million. Where the utility administration money comes from. 57% comes from electric at 1.78 million. Water is $941,000. Sewer is 314. And landfill is $94,000 with a total funding of $3.1 million. 
where the utility administration money goes. Administration of $950,000 includes all the administration personnel with the utilities, which includes the utility director, the utility analyst, the department secretary, portion of the GIS coordinator, and a portion of public works employees that assist utilities. C Central services of $1.35 million includes the allocation costs of what the $1 million to the general fund and the utilities insurance. Billing and collection is $836,000 with a total of $3.1 million in expenses. Where the electric money comes from. Charge for services is $16.4 million, which has been reduced by the 3%. Um, transfers in a voter approved capital improvement fund of 600,000 for a total funding of $16.9 million. Where the electric utility fund money goes, operations is 3.38 million. Just purchasing power is $6 million. Non-electric, which is uh, maintaining street lights is $190,000. Capital projects is 3.75 million. Transfers to the utility admin fund is 1.78 million. Depreciation is 1.1 million, with the total expenses for fiscal year 22 of 16.2 million. Where the water money, water utility fund money comes from, charge for services is 9.9 million. Infrastructure tax is expected to be about 800,000, which is about 7% less than pre-COVID. Transfers in from voter-approved capital improvement fund is 850,000 dollars. Use of water fund balance is $4.6 million, and a portion of that is because we can begin paying off our debt early starting in June 2022, and we'll, we'll be adding $2.3 million of our bond reserve to pay down that debt. So total funding is $16.1 million. Where the water utility fund money goes, operations is $1.6 million. Purchasing water is $4.6 million. Capital projects is $1.4 million. Debt service is $4.5 million, so again, that includes the $2.3 million in bond reserve that we're going to use to pay down the debt. When we first, con um, with the new bond, it would be paid off in 2032, but due to our accelerated payments, we're expecting to pay it off in 28 or 29. Transfer to utility admin fund of $941,000, amortization of $1.6 million, depreciation of $1.3 million, total expenses of 16.1 million. Where the wastewater money comes from, customer charges of $2 million, transfers in from voter approved capital improvement fund of 300,000, use of wastewater fund balance of $616,000 for a total of 2.9 million. Where the wastewater money goes is operations of 891,000, capital projects of 1.1 million, Transfers to the utility admin fund of $313,000 and depreciation of $601,000 so of total expenses of $2.9 million. Where the landfill money comes from, customer charges of $1.35 million, restricted revenues such as the construction fee and landfill closure fee of $250,000 with a total of $1.6 million in funding. Where the landfill funding goes is to contractual services of $1.17 million, transfer to the utility admin fund of $94,000, depreciation of $20,000 for total expenses of $1.2 million. The employee counts for Boulder City are not going to change from drastically from fiscal year 21 to 22. Um, we are removing a city manager position, which was called special projects. Personnel, we would like to convert a part-time office assistant to a full-time office assistant, which would have an annual cost of 83,000. That includes benefits. In community development, we will convert a contractual um, employee to a full-time office official, which will be $150,000 annually with the benefits. In utilities, we would like to reclassify the electrical engineer to a project manager slash engineer. So current FDEs is 193. Part-time personal employees is 12.8. The two new FTEs or new positions, which is the building official and the full-time office, office admin, 
Um, and then eliminate the special projects position would be a total of 206.8 employees, which moves up only one employee from last year. So a summary of fiscal year 22 um, budget, all fund balances are currently positive. There'll be a 3.6 million transfer to the special projects fund from the general fund. This includes a $1.6 million emergency capital reserve. There'll be a $2.75 million transfer from the voter approved um, capital improvement fund. This includes the million dollars to the special projects fund and 1.75 million to utilities. Um, the staff will increase from 205.8 FTEs to 206.8 FTEs. Those numbers do include part-time Percival's employees and the new, po new positions are administrative office assistant and the building official. The budget for fiscal year 22 does include contractual salary increases. So the fiscal year 22 budget adoption schedule, we're currently on February 24th, where we're in the citizen, the staff led citizen workshop. On March 10th, we'll have the city council special meeting, which will include operation and um, CIP. On April 15th, I'll submit the tentative budget to the state. Um, there's a tentative meeting if needed on April 28th for the budget with, the, with council. On May 15th, we'll publish notice for the public hearing, which is our, during our city council meeting. On May 25th, we'll adopt the final budget, adopt the um, capital improvement program, and it, adopt the pay classifications. And then on June 1st, we'll mail, mail the final budget um, to the State Department of Taxation. And that concludes our presentation of the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, if you have any questions, feel, feel, please call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnv.org. Yes, I have public comment. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, this is Fred Volz, and I had a number of questions in looking through the detailed package that you folks issued. Uh, the first one goes to the group health expense, which is account number, line number 5028. And I'm looking at fiscal year 21 and comparing it to fiscal year 22. Uh, what I'm seeing, uh, looking at the various departments that have employees in them and regular salaries, is a change that ranges everywhere from negative 10 percent up to as high as 54.5 percent. And I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, why is there this huge variance in group health expense? And can you enlighten us as to what's going on there? I'd have to know which department you're speaking of, but the group health is the same charge for all, the majority of all departments. It's a fixed cost per employee. It depends on how many employees are in that department. So depending on if they have less employees or more employees is why it would fluctuate. Well, but the employee count didn't change by 54.5%, for example, in public works. Uh, there are, let's oh, see, it's one, also, two. There is reinstated positions that were not funded, and it could have just. Mr. Voltz, this is Keegan Littrell, uh, Public Works Director. Uh, one I can point out easily, for example, is engineering. There, with last year's budget approval process, there was two vacant positions that were frozen and unfunded. Um, so you'll see the, there's a quite a large salary jump in that one. And that's because we're asking to reinstate those two positions, and therefore it trickles down into the group health insurance, um, into the and all the other um, line items below that, Medicare, Social Security. So it trickles down through those. So that's engineering and public works. Would you'd see the largest jump because of those two vacancies being refunded? 
Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'm looking at another one here, city attorney, 44.6% increase. And there wasn't really a staff change there of any type. City managers, similarly, it's up by over 34%. So it's as though however you're allocating the premiums, um, it doesn't seem to follow through consistently, even allowing for changes in staffing. Although I appreciate that comment about public works engineering, and maybe that accounts for most of the change. So I would encourage you to go back and take a look at that because it seems like whatever allocation formula you're using is really um, not being consistently applied, even allowing for changes in staff. Um, I'm having a similar uh, problem trying to understand the interfund salary reimbursement. So in looking at all the departments that actually, again, have people and are receiving this reimbursement, it comes up to a total of 785900 When I look at the spreadsheet that was provided to the Utilities Advisory Committee indicating that the utility department would be uh, charged $1,025,000 in fiscal year 22, that number doesn't tie back to the $785,900. So I'm, I'm hoping you can clarify that but I'd also suggest to you that any sort of crediting that's done uh, be going into one uh, function, whether it's the central services area that seems to be kind of a catch-all for various expenses that aren't allocated, or you create something else. Uh, it would give a lot better visibility for these charges that you're making to uh, enterprise funds uh, and other parts of the city. So the transfer of $1,025,000 is partially salaries, and it's also partially software, so you'll also see a credit inside the IT budget for interfund expenses. And right. that, will, that, that will equal, tie back if you add them all together, that. they will equal the $1,025,000 plus the transfers from the airport and from cemetery. Right, and, but there's no visibility as to where that's coming from or that the numbers tie. So... If you, you were to add up the interfund transfer from those enterprise funds and you added them all together, they will total what those credits are in the general fund. How can you credit a central services fund that has no employees for interfund salary reimbursement? There isn't a central services interfund salary reimbursement. But there is a line item for $376,000. Let me go to the page. Interfund expense reimbursement. So you're making a distinction for that versus interfund salary reimbursement, that they're two different things? They are. They are two different things. One is for the indirect costs of salaries of personnel that work for the general fund. The, other, the only other cost is the IT. That... You're looking in the wrong year budget. That was fiscal year 21. That 376 was going, okay. we were going to, it goes into risk management. We were originally going to pay it out of the general fund and then transfer it to risk management to re alleviate that step. We are transferring that money directly to risk management to pay for our insurance. Right. So when you do these things, wouldn't it be helpful for clarity's sake to explain why you're switching something around? That was a brand new fund. We worked through it, and when we tried to process it the first year, we realized that was silly to do two steps when it could just happen in one. No, so that's I why this year that it's that part of it, and I'm not questioning that. What I'm saying is that when you're choosing to move this money around in various ways, it would really be helpful to have a footnote on these printouts from the Munis system that explain increases in things, why you've moved them, where you've moved them, et cetera, so that it would be understandable to anybody who wants to look at this what you've done and what's going on and why it's happening, which would preclude a lot of the clarification questions. So, I, And the same applies to the FTE count. It's nice to have a summary at the end of the document, but it would really be helpful on each one of these budget pages to know how many FTEs 
the regular salaries and the other salaries are going to. And we don't have that presently. And that, that is a very key component. Whether Munis can do that or, again, it's a manual process, I don't know. But it, it, it would be helpful and transparent to have both these footnotes of explanation as well as the FTE counts on each appropriate budget page. So I'd suggest that to you, maybe not for this year, but in future years. That leads me to another question regarding the Munis system and what Boulder City has from it. I'm looking at a list of the modules, and I see that there's a tax billing collection function which wouldn't apply to us. But I'm curious in relationship to the request for a full-time person in the human resources personnel function, if the, our city subscribes to Munis's human capital management module. Yes, we do. Okay. And so is that module deficient in some way that you're aware of that there is all of this manual processing that the human resources people need to do and rekeying that Mr. Bolt was mentioning? I don't think Munis is lacking. I think that he was t discussing older files where he's trying to get caught up to date. Okay, so we're not missing something in this module that is causing us to have to add people. This is supposedly catch up on old files is what you're saying? And it's just he is, he is a very small team for all of the employees for Boulder City. He's a two-man team currently. Well, I'm not questioning that. What I'm questioning is if we have the right software to do the job or if Munis hasn't done a particularly complete job in the module that we have and if we would need something else, perhaps from another vendor, to make life easier for the people we do have in HR. Munis is working properly. Pardon? Munis is functioning Munis is functioning well for the city. Okay. All right, so uh, let me ask another question then about um, central services. And uh, is there any way of moving some of the items that are in that budget elsewhere? For example, the insurance expense, yes, you've moved that for the 22 budget. But there's still uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of money in there it seems like it needs to go to some... So everything that's in central services is actually because it hits all departments. Central services, if you can see how much it has shrunk, if you look at 2018, it used to be $1.4 million. The 22 budget is down to 200000 Right, but what's the point of not just taking it to zero if you've moved it so significantly from 2018? There's just some things that are still combined that we can't isolate to a particular department. Well, but if a department is incurring them, wouldn't they uh, be responsible for budgeting and expensing those items? These are shared expenses. Well, give me a for instance. Uh, I see group health insurance. That's for retired thousand. employees that are that are on old contracts that we still pay their insurance. Okay, so that doesn't really describe what it is, if that's the case. I mean, if there are other expenses that we have for retired employees, maybe those, that should be isolated into a separate budget, as opposed to just depositing it in central services where it seems to be mixed in with a ton of other uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, another suggestion for uh, improving your transparency. Um, let me move next to the uh, actual individual pages as opposed to the, the larger overview items. And I'm just working through your booklet, the 192 pages, and I'm starting on page 9. Uh, so I see under ad valorem delinquent, which are property taxes, 4102, that we had actuals of over $22,000 of delinquencies probably because of people who weren't able to pay uh, for the first half of the current fiscal year. The budget had zero in it, which is sort of understandable, but we have zero allowed for the 22 budget. 
And the problem we don't, there we don't budget be... for delinquent tax. We don't budget for delinquent property taxes. We budget budget for property taxes we're expecting, and if they pay late, they come through delinquent. Well, but you know you've already had delinquencies, and there are two more payments that are being made in the second half of the current fiscal year that will probably spike that number up more than double from what it was at the end of calendar year 2020. So why wouldn't you allow for that? We don't. We don't. If I, wait for it to happen. It's not proper accounting to budget for delinquent bills. We're not going. We're budgeting for the expected. If it comes in late, it will hit that line item. But we're not going to budget expecting or late are you payments. Are telling me that this is a state requirement or something else? Standard accounting practice. And so, even though we know we have this, we're not going to budget for it. No, because you don't know when it's going to come in. Well, if somebody hasn't made the payment. On January, I don't know if whenever. it'll come in this year or next year. Pardon? I don't know. This budget is only for fiscal year 22. I know we will have late payments. I don't know when they will come in. Well, but you still need to allow for it to just ignore the fact that we. Uh, so we are budgeting such. less than expected property taxes because we know some of them will be late. This is a budget we do not want to spend more. We're expecting more to come in than we are budgeting for. This is to ensure that we will have the funding available for all the expenses we have. You're, but you're over budgeting and you don't know when it will come in. So you should be more conservative, not presume that you're going to get 100% of what uh, we are. Owed. We're actually expecting $1.9 million in property tax revenue, and we only budgeted $1.7. I'm just talking about the ad valorem. I'm not talking about general fund taxes. So let, let's keep the discussion. That's what I was talking about. I was 40, talking about ad valorem. I'm talking about line item 4102. And that's where we know we've already had delinquencies, which is not unexpected given the uh, economic situation we're in. But to then say for 22, we're not going to do anything uh, to plan for that does not seem to be very prudent, and I can't imagine any accounting standards board uh, wanting you to do that intentionally when the circumstances uh, would suggest something far different. Going next to uh, general fund 4208 on the same page, um, franchise fees phone, uh, we had a little under $34,000 for the half year. The budget was pretty close to that. However, we're now budgeting 100000 for next year. And I'm wondering on what basis you think phone franchise fees are going to zoom up by that amount of money. So there's accruals that are in partially that you... If you look at our mid-year, the 30000 is actually low because some money came in that had we accrued back to last year, and the same thing will have happen later in this year. So even though it's halfway through the year, that's not an uh, actual reflection of half of our revenues we're expecting. Well, how, long, how far in arrears is it? A month, two months, as far as receiving the money? It's about a quarter. From the phone so it's like three months. They do it quarterly then? I believe they pay monthly, but it, it's about a, three months behind. I see. Okay. And uh, then the same explanation would apply to the franchise fees cable uh, 4209? Yes. Okay. And aside from applied analysis and their uh, generally sunny predictions about things, uh, I'm looking at the consolidated tax, line item 4336, and it works out to about a 50% increase. And yes, the economy may be rebounding on some basis, but 50%, is that really realistic? So our consolidated tax that we cut last year wasn't as low as we expected. We expected 40%. It was more, it's more down to 12%. So $11 million, which we have in this budget, is actually less than what the state is now projecting at 116 well, I understand that, but we're not out of the woods yet by a lot. So to say that we're going to go up by 50% seems 
seems to be quite optimistic uh, and not by the The state what's going provides on in the world. that projection to us, and it, we have to use what the state provides, and that is the number that they are providing to us. Mr. Volk. Based on Based on what is that number? The on, state based on their the analysis, number? and I believe they have people that work on this um, applied analytics along with other firms that are working on the assumptions. So, so you have no they, input they, to this? They, they, just tell you they are the ones do. who give us that number, Mr. Volts. I don't. understand. And what I'm asking you, though, Ms. Pelletier, is so you just do what they tell you? You have no input to this number? We use the number they give us on consolidated tax, yes. I see. Okay. Mr. Volz, I think part of it is, um, obviously, we all responded to uh, uh, the revenue loss projections for last year. That's why you see such a dramatic increase for the next fiscal year, since what was projected at the beginning of last fiscal year did not come to fruition. And I think what... Um, our finance department is saying is that uh, even though the state's projections are more optimistic, we are still more conservative. But it's re at this time, but it's realigning based on actual revenues that have come in. Well, again, I would also reemphasize that we are not out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of pain happening out in our city the county, the state, the country, and uh, being overly optimistic about the revenue uh, really isn't borne out by the situation uh, that we see on the ground and in, in the community. So the state can project all at once, but the reality may be something very, very different, and it's better to be conservative even more so than uh, assuming sunny predictions are going to come true. So that is just, again, some more feedback. Uh, you pro probably are not going to do anything with it from what you're saying, and that's certainly your prerogative. I'll move on to page 10, uh, special classes. So, Mr. Volz, just this is a workshop, and, and unfortunately no one can come in person, and I do appreciate you going through every page, but can we give you like a five-minute limit and then allow other callers to possibly call in, and then you can call back? Uh, that's fine. Uh, I was going to ask you that originally, since I was the only person who attended the other workshop that the city council had. Um, I'm guessing there aren't anybody, there aren't a whole lot of people interested in this, but that's fine. I'll be happy to ring off and ring back on. Thank you. And this is the citizen workshop. Um, for fiscal year 22 budget. If you'd like to call in, please call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnv.org. Thank you. And again, this is the sta staff-led budget workshop for citizens for fiscal year 22, but City of Boulder City budget. If you'd like to call in, please call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnv.org. Again, the number is 702-589-9629.
again. This is the Citizen Staff Ed Budget Workshop for fiscal year 22. If you would like to call in and ask a budget question, please call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnb.org. Again, the number to call with budget questions is 702-589-9629. Again, this is the City of Boulder City um, Citizen-Led Budget Workshop. If you have any budget questions, please call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnb.org. Again, if you have any budget questions, feel free to call 702-589-9629 or email finance at bcnb.org. Comment? Yes, I have a more public comment. Go ahead. Uh, yes, to pick up where we left off, this is Fred Volz again. Uh, I'm looking at page 10, and I'm looking at line item 45, 4453, special classes. 
And I'm curious to know the basis for uh, the large increase from 26,000 annualized to 60,000 for fiscal year 2022. Did you say you're looking at special classes? I'm looking at uh, line item 4453, special classes. This is on page 10 under revenues. And you show an actual of just over 26 or 13,000 for the half year. If, if we annualize it at the same level, it's 26,000 but your budget for 22 is more than double that. So are you looking at what the revenue is for special classes? Because in fiscal year 20, it was extremely low, or in 21, we budgeted extremely low due to COVID and not expecting any classes to be open, and they will be, we're expecting to reopen classes for next year, for fiscal year 22. Okay, and then looking though, the numbers have been going steadily down. If I go all the way back to 2017, uh, it was 77,000. It went up a little bit, then it dropped, and then it really dropped in 2020 actual before there was any virus uh, to be factored in. And now it's scheduled to rebound as though everything's back to normal, which uh, we are not even close to that at this point. So I'm just wondering why the optimistic projection. All of the 2020 uh, numbers were impacted by COVID because the last quarter of the year, actually uh, most things, we were shut down from uh, pretty much from March 15th almost till June. So all the, the, the actual uh, revenues were pretty much uh, shut down during that last quarter of 2020. Mm -hmm. okay. So that would impact, so. so if you're comparing that to what we're budgeting for next year, which we're on the upslope of hopefully getting out of the COVID nightmare, so we will be budgeting more revenues, and they're still probably lower than, than normal. Well, right. It's going to take a while for people to get back into something like that. So even the 60000 seems awfully optimistic under the circumstances. So... Uh, uh, I would encourage you to be a little more conservative there as well. Uh, I'll move on to 4456 in the same uh, area, the same page, special classes, or excuse me, uh, safe key, which shows up. Well, we're expecting the, schools to reopen, and when they do reopen, safe key will increase the revenues. Right, and we're at uh, an annualized number right now, 38,000, and it's going to go to 130,000 again. Mm. Again, I think you're being way optimistic on the revenues uh, in more than one category here. Uh, adult sports, you're showing this is line 4458. Uh, it's $120 negative for the first half of this fiscal year, and you're up at $10,000 for uh, 22 again. And looking at the actual, um, you haven't hit 10,000 in two and a half years. So uh, where do you think all of these folks are going to come from? Uh, kind of a head scratcher. We'll look into that. Okay. Uh, next, I'm moving on to page 14, which is the city clerk budget. And I'm looking at the interfund salary reimbursement. And I'm looking at uh, the actual, which should not have been impacted by the virus because government goes on even if everything else doesn't. So the actual for the first half of year, the year, this current fiscal year in, we're in is 17,500. And now it's suddenly going to go up from 35,000 annualized to 50,000. And I'm wondering on what basis uh, that's happening. That's me reallocating the interfund transfer. So we took all, uh, we met with all the directors 
and we we found out the time that it, they were spending with utilities and the other enterprises. And with that, we reallocated the one million dollars that goes to the general fund. Actual means what's actually transferred over. It doesn't. It's an indirect cost, so it doesn't have direct costs associated with it. No, you're giving them a credit back, which really should be going to a separate central place, not reducing the expense of the area providing the service. And that applies to all the other uh, credits, if you will, for interfund salary reimbursement that are being proposed. All these uh, uh, credits that we've, we've passed through the budget during the year, is a is a the way it has to be done is in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles and that is the most recent method where this money has to be allocated so we're just following good accounting practices and following what the what we're supposed to be doing uh, the problem with that unfortunately Ms. Pelletier is that it doesn't reflect what the total charge is and uh, we're still at the if it reflected what the total charge was it'd be more like 1.9 million instead well, of 1 million 25,000 as well and i have some real heartburn with both the percentages and uh unfortunately finance has not shown up at the utility advisory committee to uh stand for questions and input about how those numbers were calculated a spreadsheet was deposited with them and there was no explanation of that either. Uh, it was just sort of, here it is, uh, that's it. So I'm hoping that somebody from finance will manage to show up at the next Utilities Advisory Committee and go through this in detail because I find it hard to believe, if I'm remembering the number correctly, that 35% of the city manager's time is spent on utility-related things with all the meetings and all the other things that the city manager is responsible for, that over a third of his time or her time would be involved with that seems very, very um, unjustified. And I'm looking at finance next on page 15. Uh, there are some problems there that I see uh, in the, first of all, with the salaries, 5,001, where the actual for the first half of the current fiscal year is 359,000. But if you double that, uh, that takes you up to 718,000. However, the proposed budget for next year is 876,000, which is a very large increase. So I'm curious to know where the uh, backup is for that increase. Well, part of that is we're reinstating one of the frozen positions, so the funding has been added back to the finance budget. The other part of that is we've had a, uh, several vacancies during the year that uh, have resulted in the expenditures not happening. So we're trying to fill some of those positions, too. So that's the finance operations function that Ms. Lellis used to be in? Is one of those? Yes, that's one of them. And then we have the accounting manager position that's been vacant for over four months now. Okay. That's the lady who went to the city of Henderson. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. And I'm looking again at the interfund. Uh, set. Well, I'll skip that for now. Um, I'm looking at publications, subscriptions, dues, and fees, 5508, still in finance. And I see uh, almost $3,000 of actual for the first half of this year. It's 10400 for the next year's budget. And I'm wondering what is reflected in that 10400 number. There's a subscription software we use for contracts that hasn't been um, paid yet this year. So that's not a recurring expense. This is a one-time upgrade. You're no, it's looking. a reoccurring annual expense of about less than six thousand dollars. So that wasn't uh, paid for this, or won't be paid for this current year. It will be paid at some point this year, but it has not been paid yet. Okay. And travel and training fifty-five oh nine. I see uh, eight hundred thirty-five dollars uh, as an actual for the half year we're in. Um, and $20,000 for the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, is this mostly training? Is it mostly travel? 
Uh, can you clarify? Mr. Volz, it sounds like you have a lot of questions, and rather than take up everybody's time that's in the room, um, maybe we could just, um, you could call the city manager's office and schedule a meeting for us to go over all your individual questions. Well, this was supposed to be a workshop for the public, and so, it is. Uh, you know, I'm. that's what we're doing here, and yes, it takes some time, but had the budget document uh, documented some of these things that you're explaining, I, there wouldn't be the need for these questions. So uh, for anybody who might be watching who isn't calling in, they're never going to know the answers, are they, if it's not done publicly like we're doing now. Mr. Volz, this is uh, Michael Mays. What I'd be happy to do is set up the meeting and we can get answers to all your questions and then post those answers to the website so that everyone can see uh, those responses. That's fine. That's, that's a, a fine compromise situation. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I guess this concludes our workshop on, for the citizens on the 21-22 budget. And this, this uh, video will be on, on the internet, so for people to view. Okay, thank you. And just one more thing. So if you do have a budget question, you can also email finance at bcnv.org.